you that the views expressed in today's show do not reflect the views of KZLX, KNWT, or Northwest Missouri State University. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the show. With some college basketball, it is basketball season in full swing. Uh, We are well into conference play, and we've got five games to pick for you. One of them is tonight. We usually pick Friday night games. I'm excited. Um, So we've got one game tonight, three games Saturday, one of them on Monday, and two of the same team uh, in our pick'ems as well. We don't see that very often either. Uh, But the first one on our uh, our schedule, I believe, is tonight. It sure is. Uh, That one's going to be at 8 o'clock tonight. It's at the Kohl Center in Madison, Wisconsin. Maryland takes on Wisconsin tonight. Uh, Again, starting at 8 o'clock. Matchup in the Big Ten Friday night basketball, guys. Who you got? We'll start with Kramer. Well, I'm going to take the team that decided to win a few weeks ago, uh, beating Michigan at their home court. And I don't see Maryland defeating Wisconsin at all in this game. Wisconsin, I I know they have some good guys on their team, such as Ethan Happ. And he's – their whole team pretty much. And if – if Mary Lincoln decides to lock him down, well, there's a full four other guys on the court that have been lights out of late. There's a reason why they're ranked 24th now, so I got Wisconsin. I am also siding with you on that one, Kramer. I have Wisconsin, uh, mostly due to the fact it's a home game for them. They're 10-3 and three at home, and like Kramer just said, they had that Michigan game was a nice test. Um, meanwhile, Maryland, their best wins this season have been against number 24, Nebraska at the time and then number 22, Indiana. So I'm not super impressed with Maryland so far in terms of who they've played, um, but I think Wisconsin has proven that they, they've always been a contender um, to be one of those better basketball schools over time. What if I wanted to go to Jacob next? You just assumed that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll go to Jacob now. I'm going to keep it rolling with the Badgers. What? I don't like you, you don't like, you don't I don't like, like the Badgers. I don't like them. Uh, That's okay. it, it, as these guys said, Ethan Hap, he's you know <laughs> oh, averaging 18 and a half points per game. The big thing with that, 56 percent from the field. The, the big thing I look at with this game is these two teams played back on January 14th. Maryland won that game by four at home. I don't think it, Wisconsin got it figured out against Michigan. They've been on a roll as of late. I don't think this game is close. Wisconsin's at home. I think Ethan Hap goes off. Since this game's also Friday night, I'm going to do it again to Kramer. I think Iowa beats Michigan tonight. Yeah, I was just about to get that's, into that. We'll that's start. That's not going to happen. First, um, <laughs> Trevor and Jacob not here. Trevor's taking Wisconsin in this game. Jacob taking Maryland. I think he's going to be the only one. You did it. Oh, I'm here. Oh, oh, you're right. Wow. I think that's the first time I've done <laughs> that. That is I'm the sorry, first time. Jacob. Caleb. Uh, Caleb taking Maryland. It's because your name's right next to his on the screen up there. Yeah, Caleb, you need to change <laughs> that or that's going to keep happening. Caleb taking Maryland. Trevor taking Wisconsin. I think Caleb's going to be the only one taking Maryland. I'm going with the Badgers. The spread's five in favor of Wisconsin in this one, and I think that's about spot on. I think it's going to be a tough game. I think Maryland's going to put up a fight, but I think Ethan Happ uh, is just going to be too much for the Terrapins. They avenged that loss back on, I think it was, you mentioned the, the 14th of January, right? Uh, between those two, a 64 60 win for Maryland. Um, I think Wisconsin's going to avenge that loss at home and get the win. And there is, as Jacob mentioned, another big-time matchup in the Big Ten tonight. Fifth-ranked Michigan, 20-1, and are heading on the road uh, to, to Carver-Hawkeye Arena. Not necessarily known as one of the most intense places to play, but not easy. Uh, Carver-Hawkeye has been, been a host to a lot of big upsets in its day. So Carver-Hawkeye Arena will be the site for Michigan versus Iowa tonight. Iowa coming off back-to-back losses to Michigan State and Minnesota, looking to get back on track. Michigan uh, has rebounded from that loss to Wisconsin pretty well and uh, still playing some of the best defense in the country. So that one's going to be a fun one to watch. We're not picking it, but uh, it'll I be did. a fun one to watch tonight. I did, Jacob too, did. Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> do they storm the court again at Carver-Hawkeye Arena? Is Michigan oh, we, the victim of a second this? court storming? Well, I feel like, Ryan, you and I have to call this game now, too. Everybody, well, I, everybody I, else has. This is, let's just have this as a bonus Since it's point. not, it's not going to go on record in our picks, I'm going with Iowa. Uh, why not, man? Mass chaos. Yeah, no, I, I'm right there with you. For, since it's not going on our records. Yeah, yeah. I'll take Iowa. That's fine. Kramer is now mad for the rest of the show. It'll be fine. <laughs> All right, we'll, I we'll will uh, leave, guys. You guys yeah. have a fun <laughs> show. We'll have, get on out of here. We'll have a good night. Um, the next game on our list uh, is the first of two Virginia Tech Hokies matchups that we're picking in this uh, in this segment, uh, and it is Virginia Tech NC State. This one is at PNC Arena in Raleigh. Uh, Virginia Tech coming in 
12th ranked, 17 and 3 overall. NC State 13, or rather 23rd ranked, 16 and 5 overall, 4 and 4 in the ACC. And uh, another big ACC matchup: Virginia Tech trying to to cling toward the top of the conference, try to get their claws maybe on an ACC title in the regular season. NC State trying to keep themselves afloat at a 4 and 4 conference record. So, uh, who we got, guys? We will start with Jacob. I've got NC State in this one. You look at, you know, they, they ran with Virginia, took that game to overtime, almost got that upset. Virginia Tech also, right now, they seem to be a little bit of a, a hit or miss team. And yes, they were playing you know, better opponents, but 22 point loss to Virginia, 21 point loss to North Carolina. Yeah, they come back. points in that game, too. But then they come back, get a 22 point win against a, a decent Syracuse team we saw beat Duke. They just seem a little bit inconsistent. NC State, they've played a lot of close games. I think they get the job done in a close one at home. Andrew, see, I'm I I'm gonna agree with some of what you said, Jacob, but disagree with other bits. I am picking Virginia Tech in this one. I I do see though that they they're not a consistent uh, team. That when they play the bigger opponents, like you said, North Carolina and Virginia, they they don't stand on the court very long uh, before the they start to run away in the, with the game. But in some of the other games where it hasn't been a top five, top ten team. Uh, Virginia Tech has been able to dominate on the court, and I think that's what is going to happen here against NC State, who has been flip-flopping in the last couple seven games. Kramer? Going to NC State on this one, uh, I'm going back to that uh, that Virginia game uh, on just a few days ago, actually. This was a game that NC State should have won. Uh, it, they had a chance in the overtime. They got fouled for a three-point uh, three point, uh, for a three-throw line, and you missed the middle one. That's the only reason why they lost. They lost because of a free throw. I don't see – I see NC State overcoming that against Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech doesn't really have a very prolific offense. They have a very good defense on their side, but this is NC State that is a very good scoring team. And uh, our two folks not in the room at the moment, Trevor taking Virginia Tech, Caleb also taking Virginia Tech. So – uh, they're both going with the Hokies. I'm siding with Kramer and Jacob on this one. I'm taking NC State. I think they pull off the uh, the upset here uh, in, in PNC Arena. Again, what what Kramer mentioned, a good scoring team, an NC State, a team that can go on runs. They've actually scored uh, less than usual over their last few games, 66, 69, and 77. They're averaging almost 85 a game this season. And so uh, I think they're going to be able to score the basketball. They're going to be able to run around the floor and uh, – I think Virginia Tech's going to be at a disadvantage in that in that uh, space. And PNC Arena, one of the more underrated places in the ACC, not an easy place to play basketball for a road team, especially for Virginia Tech. So uh, that's going to be a tough matchup. I'm going with NC State. Three for NC State, three for Virginia Tech on our list today. Next up, also Saturday, North Carolina taking on Louisville. 1 o'clock on ESPN tomorrow. This is a big-time matchup. 16-4, 9th-ranked North Carolina, 16-5, 15th-ranked Louisville. Both one-loss teams in the ACC. And uh, teams that Louisville got the better of the Tar Heels the first time these two met. By just a bit. By just a bit <laughs> in a 21-point win for Louisville. This is at the KFC Yum Center in Louisville. Uh, a lot of tickets available for this one. Which so is a great 787 yeah. seats available in that in the uh, KFC um, Center. You guys want to go to a game um, tomorrow? Anybody want to take the drive to Louisville, Kentucky tomorrow <laughs> to, to, to see this matchup? Um, tale of two different teams here, guys, really. Uh, who you got? We'll start with Andrew. I think UNC is going to avenge the loss that they had earlier this season at home to Louisville. I know Louisville has been rolling as of recent, but I think they're going to hit a skid right here in this matchup, um, I don't. I just don't see Louisville getting the best of North Carolina twice in one year. Jacob? I've got North Carolina as well. I know Louisville's on a six-game win streak. I go back and I look at that 83-62 loss at home for North Carolina. This is the kind of game where you get up and you want to go take one from their home court. North Carolina shows up to that game, defends their home court. They set a top. The ACC, that didn't happen. Now they're they're tied there. They need to take this game from Louisville. 
Louisville knows that, that they they've got to win it as well, defend their home court. But I think North Carolina's the more talented team, and I think that's what gets it done in a close one in the KFC Yum Center. Great. I'm going off that talent the way that you said it uh, about North Carolina. It's just this Louisville team. The reason why they got into this ranked position is by defeating North Carolina, and they also defeated uh, NC State, who was ranked 24 at the time. I don't see Louisville going on a too big of a run right here. I was very surprised to look at it, seeing that they are ranked 15th. Uh, but even when we first uh, got the rundown for this week, I got North Carolina on this one. Talent-wise, they're unstoppable. But they, then again, they had those times where they don't show up to the t- to the game, and it's just one-sided the entire time. I think Louisville's playing a little bit above their pay grade at the moment. I think they're a good basketball team. I don't think they're the 15th best basketball team in the country. Um, I think North Carolina, as both both Jacob and, and Kramer mentioned, is the better team here, more talented. Um, and, and I think that shows at the KFC Yum Center tomorrow night or tomorrow afternoon. Um, I'm taking North Carolina as well. I'm agreeing with these three. Uh, we do have two that disagree, however, as uh, Caleb and Trevor both taking Louisville in this matchup, going for the home team uh, the second, second time in a row that they've agreed on that one. So... The three or the four of us here taking North Carolina in this matchup. Next up is a uh, a big time matchup in the Big Twelve. The Kansas Jayhawks are reeling at the moment. Three losses in Big Twelve play already after a loss to to Texas on Tuesday night, and uh, they're going to have to to. Get one big here at Allen Fieldhouse. Texas Tech coming to town. The 16th ranked Red Raiders also 5-3 and three in the Big 12. 3 o'clock on CBS. This one again at Allen Fieldhouse. And uh, not going to be easy. Kramer? Well, with KU not fully healthy for the rest of the season, uh, I'm going with uh, Texas Tech on this. Uh, if uh, Texas can hold KU to at least under 60 points or even at less than 65 points, they can easily take this game from KU. The defense for Texas Tech is very, very good in this Big 12. Go on, Texas Tech. Jacob. Every part of me wants to pick Texas Tech to win this game. I think Texas Tech's the better team. But I've picked against Kansas enough at home to know Kansas doesn't lose at home, even if their team isn't that great this year. I, I think they win this game. I think the issue with Texas Tech, we, we, we've meant this, we, we've talked about this the, before. They scored a bunch of points against TCU, but generally they struggled to, to put up points, and I don't think they score enough points to match Kansas. I think this is a late game win at the free throw line for Kansas. It's it's going to be tight, but I think Kansas gets enough from Allen Fieldhouse to win this game. The, the other thing is the Big 12 is right now probably not just because we live in the region, but it is the craziest conference right now. Oh, yeah, wide open up for grabs right now. Two teams sitting at 5-2 and two in conference play, Kansas State and Baylor, uh, and three teams at 5-3, and three, Texas Tech, Iowa State, Kansas. Texas sitting there at 4-4 four and four right and I, behind them as well. So, uh Really, I don't think Kansas State and Baylor are the two teams that have the best chance to win this conference, even though they're sitting at the top of it right now. I still think Texas Tech, Iowa State, Kansas, those three are going to be the ones competing for it at the end of the season. I think I think you can look at, at four. I think I think you throw K-State in there, and I, I don't think Baylor is going to continue their run and stay up there. I don't think they've got the talent, but I think it's a four-team race. And unlike everyone chasing Kansas the last – what is it, 13 years, Kansas is going to have to be protecting from everyone else. And it's going to the, – the, if Kansas is going to win the Big 12, they're going to win it in a different way they've won it in the past. And I think that's going to be good for this this Jayhawk team if that's the case. I think that, that a different experience for a Kansas team is not a bad thing if you're a Kansas fan. To have them have to compete for the conference title at the end of the season and not have it handed to them, maybe they go into the tournament with some momentum. They have a little bit more uh, reason to win the Big 12 tournament. And they go in competing, but uh, we'll move on with the picks. Let's go with Andrew. And it, it's hard to root against Kansas at home. And I know I've talked about Texas Tech every single week that we have them. I am still not sold on Texas Tech. I well, think that. Let me let me just say for a second. For a lot of people, it's very easy to root against Kansas at home. Very hard to pick against Kansas at home. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I, I get. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I can see the difference there. but Because I know Jacob's rooting against Kansas. <laughs> Very much. I would gladly take the loss in this game. I, I would take the loss, um, but it's hard to pick against. Yeah, like you yeah. said, it's hard to pick against Kansas yeah, at absolutely. home. Absolutely. And Texas Tech really has not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, you're crazy. So I'm just not a fan of Texas Tech uh, this whole season. They really have been on and off. They've they've had games where they should have won and they lost, and they've had games where they've won but by slim margins, and they're just not as consistent as I would like a top 16 team to be. Caleb and Trevor both also taking Kansas in this one. Um I think we know where I'm going with this as our resident Kansas fan. So you're going to Texas Tech, aren't you? Aren't you? Uh, no, no. I am, I am going to go with Kansas in this one. The reason being the way to beat Kansas this season has been get the ball inside, play that game, because they can't – Diedrich Lawson is not a five. He just isn't. They don't have a five without Yudoka Azubuke in the, in, in the middle. And so take advantage of that, get the ball inside. Texas Tech doesn't have that big inside presence. Their leading rebounder is a guard at just over or just under seven a game. Um, so I think Kansas has the advantage inside, which we're not going to be able to say a lot this year uh, with Deidre Lawson. So I think they're going to be able to move the ball inside. They're going to be able to, to move around in the, in the paint, which they won't be able to do a lot this year. They're going to have to shoot the lights out if they want to win the Big 12. But um, they won't have to against Texas Tech, especially not at home. Um, so I think Kansas gets the win here. It defends Allen Fieldhouse uh, once again, and they they keep the ball rolling. And I think I'm going to echo what what Jacob said in that this is no longer everybody chasing Kansas. This is a point where Kansas is going to have to take the Big 12 for themselves if they want it. And they're, the question is going to be if they want it enough because right now, to be perfectly honest, this team's not very good. They don't have the inside presence. They're not shooting the ball very well. They're not playing great defense. They're giving up over 70 points a game. Uh, lost to a Texas team that is not great. Not a great Texas team. I mean, this team is just they, – they just aren't very good right now. But I think they get the win this week and, and maybe can, can use that moving forward. So we've got one more game to pick this week. Two teams we've already picked, Louisville and Virginia Tech. It's a Monday game. Big Monday, and uh, these are two teams, again, that, that who knows what they're going to be coming off of into this game. Given our picks, um, I think we all agree that Louisville's coming off a loss. Kramer, Jacob, and I all pick that so will Virginia Tech. So two teams may be coming off a loss here. Um, what do we got in this one? Let's start with Andrew. And I will preface this with assuming that the picks that I had previously called continue. Right. right. Um, then this will be my hot take. I think Virginia Tech is going to come and – or Louisville is going to come into Virginia Tech and coming off of a big loss to North Carolina, I think Virginia Tech is going to be rolling after that NC State game and they're just going to continue to plow through Louisville. And I think it's not going to – it's going to be another blowout game, I think. Kramer? Going with uh, Virginia Tech on this one, I'll just one of the main reasons why I'm picking this is because it's a home game for them, and I'm still not sold on Louisville, really not. Uh, going Virginia Tech, Jacob. Going Louisville on this one. I- I'm not real big on Virginia Tech quite yet. I- I've yet to see them show up against a, a quality opponent. Their best win. So far this season is against Purdue when they were ranked 23rd back in November. And we know that's when Purdue was trying to find their identity as a basketball team and when they weren't playing very well. Virginia Tech, their schedule has not been that bad. They're their second best win, you could argue, is maybe Syracuse, maybe Washington, the one team that's going to come out of the Pac-12. Other than that, Virginia Tech doesn't have an impressive schedule. Louisville's schedule has been a little bit more impressive. I think after losing at home to North Carolina, they'll roll in to Castle Coliseum and they'll, they'll in an eight-point win, take down Virginia Tech. I'm thinking, you know, you go into this game from where the three of us have picked it, three of us being me, Jacob, and Kramer, both teams coming in off of a loss. Uh, one of these teams is going to lose two in a row, and I think that's Virginia Tech. I think Virginia Tech goes into NC State tomorrow night or tomorrow afternoon, I guess, and 
is looking to try to keep tabs on the top of the ACC. They're they're looking up at Louisville and North Carolina and Duke right now and Virginia and trying to keep tabs on them. I think by the end of Monday, Virginia Tech is barely staying afloat in the middle of the ACC at 6 and 4. I think they go back to back losses. I think Louisville comes in, they show up, they're able to score, they're able to just out athleticize Virginia Tech. They they were on a 6 game run. They lose to North Carolina and they bounce right back against Virginia Tech and we're still talking about Louisville uh trying to battle for the top of the ACC at this point. So I'm going with Louisville in this one. Trevor and Caleb both taking Virginia Tech. So they're taking Virginia Tech to go 2 and 0 this week both of them so um we will see what happens there that's the end of our scheduled games to pick uh in college basketball but we still have our road warriors um guys we're looking at a big week here in college basketball some teams that we were looking for true road games and a team to go in to an opponent's to an opponent's building and get a win it can't be they're too heavily favored you know we can't have uh, for example, we can't have a, uh, a, a really high-ranked team coming in and, and beating somebody at home that, that they really should beat. I don't even know if we have any examples of that this week. Say a Kentucky team going into Florida and getting a win on Saturday. That can't be your or pick. Our Michigan team going into Iowa. Who's right, to destroy Iowa. Iowa. If, if that ha- <laughs> you, know, you, you can't pick that tonight. But outside of that, we, we let them, most of them slide. So let's start with our Road Warriors this week. Let's go with Jacob first. So I'm going to go with to the bottom of the SEC, the very bottom of the SEC, Mizzou. the SEC winless Vanderbilt Oh wow! is going to head to Columbia <laughs> and take down Mizzou. And I made this pick before we, we heard about what, what came down on Mizzou midweek, uh, but I think that's just going to be – We will get to that later. I think that's going to help Vanderbilt even more, finally get a win in the SEC. We saw Vanderbilt almost take down Tennessee – Kind of ran out of steam late in the game, but I think against a Missouri team that's going to be dealing with a lot more off the basketball court right now, they'll catch Mizzou sleeping a little bit, and Vanderbilt will get on the board in the SEC. Andrew? I am sticking in the ACC uh, ACC matchup. Georgia Tech coming in to Florida State and getting the win. These two teams separated by just one game uh, in conference play. Florida State 3-4, and four, Georgia Tech 3-5. and five. Georgia Tech, having already played some really good teams, they played Louisville, North Carolina, and Duke, and uh, a couple of those games they've hung around for the majority of it, and I know the final scores were a little bit more skewed towards whoever, to their opponents, but they've hung around in those games, and it just they, they've kind of been tested already. They haven't came away with a win, but this will be a game where they're going to come in and get a statement win against a number 25-ranked Florida State team. Kramer's seeing red over there. So last week... I picked Rutgers to beat Penn State. and Scarlet Knights. They beat them. So this week I'm taking Rutgers to <laughs> defeat Ohio State. He's getting cocky, folks. One, because Ohio State's last f- five games, they've only won one game. And the past three games for the Rutgers, uh, they beat Nebraska, they beat Penn State, and they also beat Indiana. How so about Rutgers, man? Rutgers right now are just lighting Were things up. Pinning this team as maybe the worst team in all of the major conferences except for the Pac-12 at the beginning of the year. I, I think that could go bad. to Penn State now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I, you know, and I, they've they've give they've credit to me. Rutgers. Yeah, and it, it, honestly, it's being helped with uh, Eugene. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to pronounce his last name. Omari. Oh you, come on! Do you know how to pronounce that at all? I I have no idea. I, but he's almost averaging <laughs> a double double with uh, 13 points uh, and with almost eight rebounds per game. I think he's better than Caleb Wesson, um, uh, Wesson of Ohio State, so give me Rutgers on this. Plus, it's Ohio State. I'm not a – no. I was waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Trevor and Caleb, Trevor taking uh, – this one's a stretch. USC going into a really bad Washington State team in Pullman and getting the win. Um, I guess we'll, we'll keep that one. USC will be – The Pac-12 is so pretty bad heavily, that really yeah. – USC will be pretty heavily favored in that game to begin with, but that's fine. And um, Caleb taking Georgia Southern over Georgia State. Uh, I know nothing about either of those teams, so we'll assume that that's okay. Um, <laughs> Georgia Southern thirteen and eight, Georgia State fifteen and six. So there you have it, I guess. 
with those two. That's our extensive <laughs> breakdown of Georgia Southern <laughs> and Georgia State. I'd leave it to Caleb. To if one of them makes really the tournament, we'll give you some more. But until yeah. then. Yeah. Oh, well. Uh, my Road Warrior, I'm trying to help Kansas out tomorrow. I think the Longhorns go into Hilton Coliseum and uh, shatter some of that Hilton magic at Iowa State. Uh, I think Iowa State just comes out cold. There's every chance that they do that every night. If they come out cold, they can lose to anybody. We've known this about Iowa State for a long time. So I think they come out cold. I think Texas goes in and gets a win. I still don't think Texas is that good, but I think they get lucky in Hilton Coliseum and get a win in Ames. So basically half of our Road Warrior picks are all fan-related. Sort of. Not really. Well, you, I, you picked I against Iowa State. I legitimately it, think Texas is going picking. to go in and beat Iowa State. Okay. I'm going to stick in the Big Ten every week. Well, that's obvious. Go against Ohio State every week. <laughs> All right, that'll do it for our college basketball pick segment. We're going to take a break. We'll come back, and uh, there's this little thing this weekend uh, going on on Sunday that we're going to have a little chat about. We'll spend a little bit of time on it anyway. Uh, You'll know what we're talking about when we come back. You're listening to the Weekend Sports Kickoff on X106, KNWT, and on Facebook Live. Again, the Weekend Sports Kickoff. Back on the weekend sports kickoff here on X106, KNWT Channel 8, and on Facebook Live. Guys, so someone want to remind me what on earth is going on on Sunday? Uh, very good commercials. Yes. Yeah. That, that's what we're all watching Snacks. for. Snacks. Uh, parties. <laughs> like you for some people, <laughs> not in the sports department. Um, there, there's also some football. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It's Super Bowl week, guys. Um, Super Bowl Sunday coming up this uh, this Sunday. Uh, pre-game starts at like 5 a.m. Goes all day. When, when does the game actually kick off? Do we know? It's, Probably, not, it's, it's normally like, it's like something like 5, 5, 5 30, 5 15. They, they throw so, like 5 23. That's yeah. weird. It's 5 30. 5 30 kickoff. 5 30. Mercedes Benz Stadium. It'll be like five thirty seven is when the when the kickoff is. Yeah. Yeah. Tickets as low as twenty three hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's interested. <laughs> yeah. That's Mercedes, actually that's actually like that's low cheap. for a Super Bowl. Right. It's way up in the top corner of Mercedes Benz Stadium. That's a little bit high for me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Mercedes Benz Stadium in Atlanta gonna play host to the uh, New England Patriots and the Los Angeles Rams uh, on Sunday for Super Bowl fifty three. And, uh, guys, we've been through 52 of these. We've seen the Patriots do this enough times. We're going we're gonna to pick the game. We're going to pick the MVP. Uh, I think we're even picking the final score. But, guys, does it feel like the Rams have any chance in this one? No. And, I mean, they, they might if Belichick wakes up on his right side the ne- in that morning, uh, possibly because he probably lays on his back. He's one of those back sleepers. I don't – probably not. I think this game ends up and looks a lot like the first half of the Chiefs game for the Rams. The problem is the Rams don't have Patrick Mahomes, and they can't come back. But the Rams have a better defense than the Chiefs. That that doesn't help the situation. Do they, though? Do they? they? Andrew? I'm not sure. I, I've been back and forth on it. I think the Patriots do uh, squeak out a win here, 31-24. But I think it's going to be a low-scoring first-half game probably a 10-7 game, and then in the second half is where we start to see all the action. Yeah. So with that, let's take it to our picks for the game here. Um, as uh, We'll open with, with Trevor and Caleb, as they are not on screen at the moment. Trevor uh, taking a 38-17 Patriots win uh, in that one, and Tom Brady as the MVP. If it's 38-17, Tom Brady will probably be the MVP. Um, I think that might be a little bit too one-sided for me. But uh, and Caleb, twenty eight twenty one Patriots and Tom Brady as the MVP in his pick there. Uh, I think that's a little bit more realistic. Trevor, thirty eight seventeen, really? Wow. He he's been all week oh. long saying he does not think the Super Bowl is close. So we'll see. I hope we. You got to give him credit for sticking with with his take. That's we'll true. see. All right. Uh, so let's get to the rest of our picks. Andrew, you already mentioned yours. You want to go over it again? Uh, 
Patriots 31-24, like I said, 10-7 game first half most likely. Second half is when we'll start to see a bunch of the heroics unfold. And I have Tom Brady as the MVP, but I think in a game where it's that close, it's it's kind of a toss-up. You could, it, Depending on what happens in that game, it could be going to someone like Sonny Michel or someone who, who has a great game other than Brady. But for now, it's Brady. And Kramer? Go with the Patriots on this one, 34-28. I, this might actually be a very good game. I really I expect this to go down to the wire like most games uh, for Patriots. They actually might lose as well. Like close games for them in the Super Bowl usually ends up them losing, but I have them winning this uh, this time. Hopefully, Sonny Michelle gets the MVP as I I think he will have another 100 yard performance uh, as he has this entire entire postseason uh, on the rushing side. So, Sonny Michelle. It might be the dark horse in this entire Super Bowl for it to like not being looked at by a team. Jacob, I think this game is a little bit low, lower scoring than everyone else is picking. I have a Patriots twenty-one seventeen, and I think it, it sits at a fourteen to three game at halftime. And with about six minutes left to go in the game, it's twenty-one to three still. Oh, okay. I, was I think 14, it's a twenty-one. I think it's a twenty-one seventeen game with some garbage time touchdowns for the Rams to try to make it interesting in the end. But I think the Patriots win this one. It, the, the, the score will look a lot closer than the game is, one of those cliche scenarios. I think Sony Michelle scores all three touchdowns for the Patriots from about the two- or three-yard line and ends up with the MVP. Here's where I'm at in this one. Um, I'm, I'm going to be different. I am taking the Los Angeles Rams. Good luck. In a season dominated by offense, this one is going to come down to defense. 28 25 is my final score in favor of the Los Angeles Rams. Yeah, you're going to have to explain where you're getting 25 from. I'll get there. 28 25. Um, I think it's 28 to 17 Rams Uh, with three or four minutes to go in the game. Patriots score. Go for two to cut it to a field goal. They get the ball back. Ooh. The story is, uh uh-oh, here comes Tom Brady. He's doing it again. He's going to come back. He's going to lead him back. They're going to kick a field goal, go to overtime. We're going to keep going. 40 seconds to go in the game. Brady hit as he throws by Aaron Donald. (laughs) Ball goes wild up into the air, into the hands of the most hated man on the planet right now, Nickel Roby Coleman. That'd be a good story. Game ceiling interception, game is over. And again, in a in a, a season dominated by offense, it's defense that wins the Super Bowl. I could see that happening, and then he'd probably be the MVP. Cole. My MVP is Aaron Donald. Okay, <laughs> I think he has four sacks. I think you the, think they can get to Tom Brady. I think that he many times gets to Tom Brady. That yeah, many times. You gotta specify him. <laughs> so I think so he gets to Tom Brady. That so the Rams time. have four sacks total, and they're all for yeah, Aaron four Donald. or five, and I think it's all Aaron Donald because I, Aaron Donald is the most powerful defensive lineman in the NFL, and that's something that I don't care who you have at quarterback. That kind of power is unbelievably hard to avoid, even if you're Tom Brady, even if you have an incredible offensive line in front of you. I think Aaron Donald is powerful enough that he can get to Tom Brady four times. I think he has an incredible game on the biggest stage of them all. He just ratchets that up just a little bit more. And I think Aaron Donald wins Super Bowl MVP, becomes the 10th defensive player uh, to win win MVP of the Super Bowl. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm giving it to Aaron Donald and the Los Angeles Rams. So Jared Goff becomes a Super Bowl winning quarterback. Well, probably a little bit early, but I think he's got the coach that he definitely, yeah. at some point, would be a, a Super Bowl winning quarterback. And so that's, and I think you know that it comes down to everybody's talked about you know with with Zerline in this game we could get the biggest, the longest field goal in in Super Bowl history, whatever. If if we get the opportunity, I don't think it comes down to that. I think it comes down to the defense. And so I think that would be the storybook ending here to have the man that is – he's the most hated man in, in football at the moment, <laughs> other and than it, Roger Goodell. Yeah. And, and that that play is still that, – that unfortunately, that's still the storyline still to this day heading into the Super yeah. Bowl. 
and it's you know the, all the questions Goodell had to answer at his press conference, and I, for the sake of the NFL, I think the Patriots need to win this game. For the sake of the Rams, I think they need to win a Super Bowl in a different way. I it, think it, it's not the Rams' fault. It's, it's literally not the Rams' the fault. fault. It's that's, not the Rams' that's, fault. That's but they I, still shouldn't be here. And and any if they win the Super Bowl, even if they you know let's say theoretically they blow Tom Brady out, Tom Brady cries off into retirement. Bill Belichick leaves the scene. The Rams are still going to have an asterisk next to this this Super Bowl, even though by that point the entire NFL will love them for running Tom Brady off into the sunset. Well, but, and if if you're Los Angeles, I say okay, fine, we'll we'll accept it. We'll be the bad guys here. We'll show up and we'll beat Tom Brady in the Super Bowl. And you know what? Let's come it, back and win it the, next year. When too. is the last time there was a Super Bowl where most people didn't want to root for either team? Like, because most Super Bowls, if your team doesn't make it, you pick. You don't pick a team to root for, but you pick a team you want to win over the other one. Yeah. There, I mean, you don't want Tom Brady to win it, but you don't want the Rams to win it either. It's a. I want the Rams to win. Tom Brady also. I just want to mention Tom Brady, winless against Bearcats in the Super Bowl. He's got another one this this Sunday in in Matt Longacre, who's zero and two against Dave Tollefson in 07 and eleven. So winless against Bearcats in the Super Bowl. He, here, here's another question. I know Tom Brady has come out and he said there's zero chance that he's retiring. Do we believe him? Yeah, I do. I do too. I think what would be funny though um, is if this if this game goes to OT and the coin toss once again dictates it. Brady gets it, goes down the field, scores a touchdown. They win the game in heroic fashion, like he did in the AFC Championship game. At that point, would the NFL take a look at the overtime rules and say, well, listen, we got to at least give the other guy a chance here in the Super Bowl? They won't ever admit that they're wrong. The NFL will never admit that they did something wrong. I mean, they've never even explicitly – they've kind of kind of said something about the call, in the same, but they've never said they were right. wrong. Right. They, the NFL will never admit that they did something wrong, that, they, that the system is flawed. Um, and so, no, I don't think I don't think anything changes in the overtime rules. I do think, however, that in my scenario that I've cooked up for the Super Bowl, as he gets hit by Aaron Donald, as he throws, uh, he gets lit up by Aaron Donald, and I think we finally see physically Tom Brady crumble. I don't hope for that. I don't hope that he gets injured. I don't, I'm never going to hope anybody gets injured. But I think that that this is the point at which we finally see Tom Brady's cool. body fail him. And that that's why he's been able to last this long. That's why he thinks he can keep playing is he right. doesn't get hit. Right. And I think and I think this is the time he does and we see his body fail him. I mean, we know he can't run. Have you seen right. him? I mean, he never could really run, but right. now it's 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 a little bit sad watching Tom Brady run. He has over a thousand yards uh, rushing. In career a, in his eighteen, career. 18 year. Career, career, yeah. <laughs> Just saying it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> throw that out there. That's almost fifty yards a year, Kramer. Uh, that's, <laughs> hey, uh, that's that's what happens. <laughs> Hall of Fame <laughs> running back level? No. no, no, no. But yeah, so yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> go blue, baby. Oh man. Yeah, I the Super Bowl to me. Yes, I want to watch the Super Bowl. I'll probably end up watching most of it. That'd be great. But this it, is the least intriguing Super Bowl, I think. That, that I've I've seen and, in the and, last I, and I would agree with that and we said this last week we know that, th- that this isn't the most intriguing Super Bowl you really hoped it was some other teams in the Super Bowl but at least is where we are in our you know sports world we're gonna watch the Super Bowl and there's a lot of people that, that don't really want to watch it they're gonna watch the Super Bowl it's an event you're gonna tune in you may not be as invested in it as in the past in the last few years, but it's still going to be on in, in most houses in the United States. I know what I'm tuning into during halftime. Some wrestling. <laughs> What's going on at halftime of the Super Bowl? Well, you, you know how they're just having their uh, their halftime show with Maroon 5? Right. So during the Royal Rumble uh, last Sunday, they said, hey, why watch this? And it had a picture of, uh, of uh, Maroon 5 on there. And they're like, you could watch this. So there's a huge match going on. Oh. Uh-huh. I'm excited to see what Maroon Five does. Um, We're probably gonna watch wrestling during. It's four. gonna be. It, Isn't it like Maroon Five featuring like eight other people now? Yeah, and Maroon Five hasn't been good since like 2006. 
Yeah, they had a good song so, about 2012. It, 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 they just. It, but I feel like every single week there's a new rapper they're featuring. And yeah. Like, I think it's up to like, like legitimately, yeah. I think it's up to like three other. I, th- I think we'll halftime show for, artists they're featuring. For, um, uh, for the Super Bowl is overrated, anyways. I, I've, there I've hasn't been a good that. halftime show since Prince. That's true. I'll come out and say it now. I agree. Yeah. I still remember watching the Black Eyed Peas halftime show. That was oh terrible. My, that was pretty bad. Awful. But yeah, no, we haven't had a good halftime show since Prince. Do you think they overproduce it? Oh yeah, I absolutely. do. It just, takes way too I, I long. Think, I think you should just put some people on a stage and let them do their. Isn't thing. it a thirty? Well, minute, none of the audio is live. Thir- isn't it a thirty minutes? Uh, I have oh, no idea. I think the uh, halftime of the Super Bowl is way too long. I I could have watched Prince for another thirty minutes. Outside of that, I think you're right. I think it hurts the players in in terms of. Because they're waiting there. Well, yeah, because not only do you have a 20-minute performance from whoever, then you've got to clear everything off the field and get everything ready to go. for. So wasn't it after halftime is when the lights went out at the it was a Silver Dome? I no. don't remember. I don't know what you're talking about. They lost the lights. They, they could have been because of the halftime performance. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we all know everybody watches the Super Bowl for the commercials. Yeah. Um, I mean... Yeah, <laughs> and we've been disappointed the last few years. I'm going to say have. some of the because uh, now they promo the yeah, they put them on they, YouTube they, no, like they, a week before. Well, like this mm-hmm. year, I've seen a lot of promos for company Super Bowl commercials. They're not releasing the full commercial. They're promoing their promo basically. That, well, <laughs> it's great, but <laughs> good marketing scheme. I, right I'm there. intrigued oh, yeah. by some of the Super Bowl promos I have seen. I haven't seen any. Like I've I'm staying away. My until issue. That day. My issue as is is um. Doritos has lowered the bar. They have. They. You remember when every year during the Super Bowl we were like, "Oh man, I can't wait for the next Doritos commercial," because they were doing some great stuff. The Time Machine commercial that they did, the one with the samurai. I mean, those were great commercials. Can, can we make our pick for who's going to win the Super Bowl commercial? Wise yeah, year? let's. Okay, let's pick. Let's pick the Super Bowl commercial winner. Tied. Tied. I think Tide wins the Super Bowl right. this year. I. I'm going to say it's going to be uh, Budweiser. I think that um, in in heroic fashion, Chick-fil-A is going to win it on a Chick-fil-A. Sunday. Chick-fil-A. On a Sunday. That would be hilarious. There would be no better way. To is, is Chick-fil-A planning a commercial? Celebrate. I don't know. I don't even know. They really don't need to. No, they don't. No. I think Doritos steps it back up. I, I think Doritos comes back and has this just some sort of ridiculous, and it's not even going to be anything that like is clever. They're just going to come out and you're going to watch it and go, "What on earth just happened?" And then you'll look the next day and it'll be the number one commercial. Exactly. Gotcha. I was exactly. telling I was telling Kale about this before. Um, you know that Tony Romo commercial, the, the Corona, Corona one. Yeah. yeah, I th- I think that it would be really funny if if they aired one of those where the caller had called in and it was actually Tony Romo in the booth and he'd have a conversation with himself on that island. I think that would be hysterical. That would be funny. So a live commercial? Yeah, well, not well, live. You know, remember pre-recorded. what they did with oh, Tide okay. and Terry Bradshaw a couple years back? He had a the Tide the um, to-go pen that mm-hmm. he had a stain and, you know, they made sure to get it done before the second half started or before he had to go on for the halftime show. That was interesting. I think if they did something like that, like that would be similar to that Corona idea. But I think... I think Doritos ends up being everybody's favorite. I think Budweiser has the best one because they always do like they they they'll they'll touch at the emotions for the Super Bowl. Budweiser mm-hmm. usually does, or Anheuser Busch anyway, usually does. So if this tells you how intriguing the Super Bowl is to even the sports people, Caleb, we're, Caleb we're, we're, we we spent maybe five minutes talking about the actual hey game and then we moved on. So Caleb wanted me to make sure to go this over air. His Geico is going to be his, the best. I think that's not a bad pick. I think I think Ge- Geico's there's a chance. Been, Geico's been doing well. Geico, well, they've been running this. The best of, yeah, yeah. And all they're doing to me is proving they've been making quality commercials for the last 20 yeah, years. Yeah, man. Nothing gets any better than Hump Day. Are you kidding me? Is that the best commercial of all time? No. Okay. No. Is it, is it, is it on the list? I think so. I think, it's, I think it's if you make like a top 10 or a top 20 list, Hump Day is, is close. I don't even know what the best commercial of all time. Oh, I know what the best commercial of all time is. Like 2004. Miller did a one-second commercial for their Miller High Life. They bought a second worth of Super Bowl spot, 
and it was uh, the dude's dead now. I can't remember his name, but the he's he's a really good actor, uh, really good comedic actor. Just came on and yelled high life at you. It was just like a one <laughs> second clip. That was it. It was great. That's the best. I wonder what of all time. I wonder what followed that commercial because one second out of a uh, fifteen second block or thirty second block. That's a. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what happened, but I, yeah, they bought one second worth of Super Bowl ad time, and just had him yell high life. Now Miller does have a uh, some very good historic uh, commercials for the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. I think I think emotionally, Anheuser Busch is always and and Budweiser with the the dog that ran away and came oh, that back. Was, that was that was a tear. I, I'm and, not gonna uh, lie. Last year's I teared up. last year's uh, immigration one. Mm, that was a good one. Was was interesting and and I still see that the Clydesdales often. and all of that. You know. So it's going to be fun to watch. And, uh, you know, everybody's all up in arms about Gillette now. I guarantee you yeah, they come out recently. with something. I, I would. Yeah. If I was Gillette, you need yeah. to capitalize on what they're doing. Foot on the – I mean, if I'm Gillette, foot on the gas, man. Speaking of Gillette, I probably – that's not an advertisement. I need to shave. <laughs> it's not an advertisement, <laughs> but I need to shave. Great. We've been cut off the air now <laughs> because Gillette's paying Kramer under the table. <laughs> That's not true. Not, not true at all. No part of that is true. We need to take a break before somebody fires us all. Uh, before we get a call from the FCC, we need to take a break. Uh, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back and give some season awards away from the NFL. Uh, MVP, Defensive Offensive Player of the Year, rookies, coaches. We're also going to talk NFL Hall of Fame. So we're not done with the NFL. We're going to come back and uh, and talk a little bit more right after this break. You're listening and listening to and watching the Weekend Sports Kickoff on X106, Facebook Live, KNWT, Channel 8. First, we have a story from Andrew Botwinick we were talking about during the break. I believe he's going to tell us a little bit about uh, some sort of video or something. Before he talks, so as of uh, as we found out this year, that we have a person in this room that can lock down Bull Bull. And, yes. Yeah, which and, is and ridiculous. Which, yeah, I still we, don't know if I believe that. Sixth grade. S- Jacob sixth, Blair, grade. sixth grade. We're not Jacob, talking yeah. high school. Now. Talking sixth grade. S- still, he, we have a person that locked down Bull Bull, and we also have a person in this room it has like almost what over one million views on Vine, doing play by play, because of a guy that you you know personally. Yeah, so I went to the same high school as Drew Lock. I've kind of said that a couple times on air before, and we we would always do play by play and color commentary for the basketball games, and there was one game I don't remember specifically the game, but there was a loose ball and Drew got it and drove into the paint and there was some small unfortunate guard in the in the paint and he stood his ground and uh drew just dunked on him and i remember we were calling we were calling the game uh me and this other guy in broadcasting and a, a week later someone had sent a vine to me and they were like hey check this out i'm pretty sure this is you and sure enough it was the vine of the commentary that i had done on his game so it was just something that i had looked at and it had like over a million views and I think it was on YouTube later that that week. He for is those Vine of famous. you, for those of you that don't know, <laughs> hey, Vine Famous will get you places nowadays. That's very apparently. true. There's a lot of guys that have stand up specials. Hey, go on, <laughs> move into stand up now. Hey, you but, got you're an in. <laughs> uh, one of the things that, that for those who don't know, for those who either aren't up to date or are too up to date, Vine for two three years was. It, 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 it had exploded into these, there was like six, seven second videos that people would use for entertainment. It was like the YouTube of very, very short videos. Um, some of which were very entertaining. Others were just dumb. But for those of you that don't know, the older people out there that may not know what Vine is and or was, it was kind of a flash and, you know, just came out of nowhere. Uh, and then some people who are, who are new enough and who are current enough to have not known what Vine was. Um, so, anyway, we thought we'd clarify. Let's talk about the NFL. Very awesome, though. Very <laughs> awesome. Um, Had to bring that up on air. We have, uh, we're going to pick some, some awards. We're going to take our Hall of Fame inductees um, and kind of give our, our breakdown of how, how the season went. So regular season is over. Most of the postseason is over. Super Bowl Sunday is is coming up this Sunday, and then football's gone until August, for the most part. The AAF American or Alliance of American Football, I guess, is starting up 
I think February 12th, something like that. That Whatever. It's another football league that nobody really cares about. So let's go through our awards. Uh, we're, we're, we're picking the MVP. We're picking the Defensive Player of the Year. We're picking Offensive Rookie of the Year, Defensive Rookie of the Year, and Coach of the Year. All right? I don't know. Are we, yeah. So so those are those are who we're picking. And if I can get the graphics up somewhere, I'll tell you who Trevor and Caleb picked. But before I get those, um, oh, here come our Hall of Fame picks. That's not what I'm looking for. Okay. We'll do we'll do the NFL awards first. Let's start with Jacob and give me your awards. So let's we start just, with MVP. We're just going through Yeah, we'll go around with MVP, we'll go around with defensive player of the year, we'll go around. So let's let's start with MVP, Jacob. Patrick Mahomes. I, this shouldn't be close. I know Drew Brees had a great season, but you put up 50 touchdowns, 5,000 yards, second person ever to do that, third person ever to throw 50 touchdowns. That it's that's what's got to that that who that's who your MVP has to be. You take a Chiefs team that was projected to be eight and eight, nine and seven, maybe you take them to the number one seed and have an opportunity to put them in the Super Bowl. The defense doesn't get it done. I think yeah, this shouldn't. This shouldn't be a conversation. It is because it's Patrick Mahomes' first year as a starter and Drew Brees is rounding out his career. But stat-wise, this is Patrick Mahomes. And since we have had them all up on the graphic there, let's go ahead and go through Defensive Player of the Year, Defensive Offensive Rookie of the Year, Coach of the Year. Let's just go through everything for you real quick uh, since deep, we already had them all up there. Defensive Player of the Year, that I think is should be a consensus pick all the way across this panel and every panel with Aaron Donald. I don't think that's that's even a conversation. My offensive rookie of the year, that one, it's going to be between Saquon Barkley and Baker Mayfield. I think Saquon Barkley, stat-wise, should be the easy pick. 2,000-plus scrimmage yards. I know Baker Mayfield helped the Browns stop Browning, but this is a stat of what? You didn't like that? No. <laughs> Never say that again. <laughs> the Browns I, I literally Browning. looked. Uh, I was not even as looking in at you. Jake Browning? No. As in the as in <laughs> Cleveland we, Browning. We are creating a verb out of the Browns is what we are yeah. doing. Same, 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 function as, that, same function as Googling. No. I, yeah. I, I'll just be quiet. Okay. <laughs> You're also the one that says Kansas is not healthy. They're not. They they don't have um, Azabuke, or however you pronounce his name. But off, offensive rookie of the year, Saquon Barkley. My defensive rookie of the year is Leighton Vander Esch for the Dallas Cowboys. I think he really helped that defense and, and kind of filled the void where, where Sean Lee was hurt a lot of the time, and, and he filled that void. And then coach of the year, Matt Nagy, with Chicago and his turnaround of that team. Andrew? I am, for the most part, sticking with some of the same ones as Jacob. I also have Mahomes as MVP. Um, like he said, third quarterback to throw 50 touchdowns. The previous two won the MVP that season. Defensive player of the year, Aaron Donald, over 20 sacks this season. Just phenomenal. He was able to control almost every single game it looked like. Um, rookie of the year, though, on offense, however, I do think that they will side with Baker Mayfield. Looking at the stats, though, I completely agree. I think Saquon should be getting the award, but the panel tends to view quarterbacks um, more or higher up, I would, I, I'd say. But uh, defensive rookie of the year, I, I would have to give it to Darius Leonard. I think what he's been able to do for Indianapolis this season has been uh, nothing short of just amazing. He's leading the – he led the NFL in tackles this season, uh, just a phenomenal player. And then coach of the year, like what Jacob said, Matt Nagy, just able to build everybody together and build that team up and be able to compete every single week. Kramer. So going through my list – I gotta pull it up real quick. I just lost it. Um, uh, for MVP, Patrick Mahomes, uh, Defensive Player of the Year, Aaron Donald. If Cleo Mack was gonna go on pace of what he did at the first three weeks, four weeks of the season, I probably would have Cleo Mack as my Defensive Player of the Year. Aaron Donald, because Aaron Donald. Uh, Saquon Barkley as uh, my Offensive Rookie of the Year. Bradley Chubb as defense, and the head coach Anthony Lynn. All right. Um, let's go through. Uh, Trevor and Caleb's picks real quick before we get to mine um, so we know where where they went. Uh, Trevor, his MVP was Patrick Mahomes, Defensive Player of the Year, Aaron Donald, Baker Mayfield, Offensive Rookie, Darius Leonard, Defensive Rookie, Matt Nagy, Coach of the Year. Um, as for Caleb, maybe. 
I'm interested to see what Caleb put. He's usually the one that's that's different from everybody as as Kramer winks at the camera. Uh, we may be having some technical if- issues with getting those picks up. It's a great um, face to land on, though, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, Caleb... Yeah, I've got Caleb's list right here. One that's usually different, but this there time pretty similar. MVP Patrick Mahomes, Defensive Player of the Year, and Donald, Baker Mayfield, Darius Leonard, and uh, Andy Reid. As the as the NFL coach of the year, um, so I think he's I think he's the only one picking Andy Reid. As for me, um, my MVP is Patrick Mahomes. I think he just he did things this year that nobody else did. I, I, I just it, that there's no question about that. His his season was the best season of anybody in the NFL this year. Period. And so that that to me earns the MVP award. I um, really wish he had seventy touchdowns. I really <laughs> did like. He probably, if he did have seventy touchdowns, uh, probably be in Super Bowl. Um, if he had seventy touchdowns, <laughs> put him he in. would have an NFL record <laughs> by fifteen touchdowns. He he would have a spot to, in the Hall of Fame already. Yeah, seriously. Um, but uh, you know, he did things that that nobody else in the NFL did. You know, some people talk about you know without Patrick Mahomes, the Chiefs would have been a ten and six team. Without Drew Brees, the Saints would have been a seven and nine team. While that may be true. By the end of the season, Patrick Mahomes, Patrick Mahomes was statistically enough ahead of Drew Brees that that argument wasn't valid anyway. So Patrick Mahomes for me, uh, defensive player of the year is Aaron Donald. That's again should be consensus. He just it, he he was a, a man among boys this year. Offensive rookie of the year I think should be Saquon Barkley, but it won't be. I think they're going to go with Baker Mayfield. It would make sense to give it to Baker Mayfield. But because it's me picking, I'm picking Saquon Barkley, but I think the committee is going to go with, with Baker Mayfield uh, because he won in Cleveland. He won, he, He's going to be the that starter. Was, that was the point behind my statement that right. made Kramer cringe. He's going to be the starter in Cleveland for more than one season. That hasn't been done since Tim Couch. And everybody listening is going, who? Exactly. It's been a long time. 2001, 2002, the two seasons that Tim Couch started in Cleveland. Um, I think Baker Mayfield is going to win it, but I think Barkley should because in comparison to everyone else at the position, I think Barkley has a higher standing than Baker Mayfield does. Well, I know Barkley was on the Giants, but was he the best running back in the NFL this year? One of them. I mean, One. If, if he wasn't, he was close. Because – I think Todd Gurley, I think, has a little bit of an argument because of what he did in the passing game, but Barkley was really good in the passing game as well. So Barkley was the almost the entire offense for the Giants. I mean, yeah, I think I think you definitely have an argument if you're Saquon Barkley for being the best running back in the NFL. So I I I want to give it to Saquon Barkley, so I'm going to pick him. But I think the committee is going to go with Baker Mayfield, defensive rookie of the year. I'm going with Leighton Vander Esch as well. I think he's just he's he's been really impressive. And really sort of unexpected. I thought he was going to be a good linebacker. I didn't know he was going to be as good as he's been. He has really anchored that defense and done a really good job of it. Um, and then my coach of the year is Anthony Lynn. Uh, I think Nagy did a really good job in, in Chicago. I think he made them better than we thought they were going to be. But I think in terms of a coach that made a team better than, they, than we thought they were going to be by leaps and bounds, I'm going with Anthony Lynn. We thought – Beginning of the season, a lot of us that San Diego was going to go eight and eight, nine and seven. We we're like, okay, they haven't proven anything to us to go twelve and four, and have the season that they had, and have such a great offense and play pretty well defensively too. I- I'm going with Anthony Lynn for my coach of the year. Next up, all the awards are out of the way. We're talking Hall of Fame. It's been narrowed to fifteen. They're going to announce the final ten here in a few days. And they're going to announce the final five later. Final five finalists then go to a committee. They need 80% yes votes to, to make it to the Hall of Fame. Usually the number is five that get in. Usually everybody who's in the finalists with five will get 80% and probably get in. Doesn't always happen. We'll see. But uh, So we are going to pick our five Hall of Famers. And while I am here, let's give you the, the, the list of the candidates. Um, there are 15. 15 candidates, uh, 15 finalists. We have Isaac Bruce, wide receiver, key key piece of the greatest show on turf in St. Louis. Edron James 
Indianapolis Colts, Arizona Cardinals running back for a long time. Uh, Tony Gonzalez, Chiefs and, uh, and Falcons tight end. Ed Reed, safety for the Ravens. Steve Atwater, safety a uh, long time for, for the Denver Broncos. Also a Denver Broncos defensive back, Champ Bailey, uh, who was a corner. Ty Law, uh, cornerback in the NFL, played for a number of different franchises, most notably probably the Patriots. That's where everybody remembers him. John Lynch, a free safety in the NFL, uh, played a long time for the Buccaneers, played a long time for, for the Denver Broncos, an enforcer at the safety position. Kevin Mawai, uh, a center. You don't see many centers in the Hall of Fame, but certainly an opportunity there. Alan Fanica, uh, a longtime Pittsburgh Steeler on a lot of really good teams in Pittsburgh. A guard. Richard Seymour, a defensive tackle, defensive end. He played in Seattle. He played in Oakland. He played in a number of places, did Richard Seymour. Tom Flores, head coach. Don Coriel, head coach, both on the list. Tony Baselli, a ta- uh, tackle. And Steve Hutchinson, a guard uh, on those Sean Alexander and Matt Hasselbeck-led Seattle Seahawks teams. So let's get to our picks for, uh, for the five finalists for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. We'll start with Trevor um, get these out of the way first. Tony Gonzalez, Ed Reed, Isaac Bruce, Chant Bailey, and Alan Fanica uh, for him are the five that he's going with. All legitimate picks, all deserving picks uh, to go into the Hall of Fame. Caleb um, looks like the exact same thing. Tony Gonzalez, Ed Reed, Isaac Bruce, Chant Bailey, and Alan Fanica for him as well. No surprise Alan Fanica is on that list um, for Caleb being being the Steelers fan that he is. So let's go through ours, and let's start with Kramer this time. Give me the five guys that you're putting in the Hall of Fame from the NFL this year. I'm putting in Tony Gonzalez, John Lynch, Champ Bailey, Ed Reed, and Edron James. That's my five yeah. that I'm putting in. Okay. Andrew? I have Isaac Bruce, Tony Gonzalez, uh, Kevin Maway, uh, Champ Bailey, and then Ed Reed rounding out my five. All right. Jacob? And then uh, with these, I think there, there's three, and you can maybe say four, that really stand out from the rest of them. And then the, the fifth one is one that you can kind of choose differently. But I have Tony Gonzalez, Ed Reed, Isaac Bruce, Champ Bailey, and then I put John Lynch as my fifth into the Hall of Fame. And uh, for me, I'm going with Tony Gonzalez, Ed Reed. Those are the two automatic. I'm taking Edger and James. Um. Steve Hutchinson, and who else did I go with? I don't remember. I think I think Chant Bailey. No, Isaac Bruce. Sorry, Edger and James, Isaac Bruce, Steve Hutchinson, Ed Reed, Tony Gonzalez. Those are my five. Um, I've forgotten. He's Isaac Bruce is on the top of the list I'm looking at, so he kind of blended in with the rest of the story there, but. Um, those are the, those are the five that I'm going with. Does anybody want to give give some arguments on to reasons why they put in somebody and kept somebody else out? Like I, like I said, I think you know Tony Gonzalez, Ed Reed. There's no argument yeah, that they shouldn't be. And then really guys like Isaac Bruce, and then there's some others. There's really six, seven, eight names on this list. It's a to me, it's a, a pretty clear cut list, and and really. As long as it's one of these, one of the, there's really six, seven, eight names, and it's any of those six, seven, eight other than we know Tony Gonzalez, Ed Reed. Those are pretty much locks. There's no argument for someone that shouldn't be someone should be. It's a very solid list this year. I can agree with that. I think you know a lot of people will probably look at and say why why Steve Hutchinson. Um, Steve Hutchinson was the enforcer for that Seattle Seahawks offensive line. Everybody remember when Sean Alexander was rushing for 5,000 touchdowns a year? Well, that was, he yes. was every single one of those scores seemed to be behind Steve Hutchinson. Um, he did an incredible job on that Seattle Seahawks offensive line. Uh, also played for the Minnesota Vikings during the early years of Adrian Peterson's career. Um, and so he's he has been the road grader of sorts for – many of some of the better running backs in, in recent NFL history. Um, I'll make a case for Isaac Bruce. In terms of the passing game, that man made the greatest show on turf. Everybody talks about Marshall Falk. Yeah, 
Falk was great in the passing game. You know, 1,000 rushing yards, 1,000 receiving yards. That's the, rarely do you ever see that. But the reason Marshall Falk was such a feature in the passing game was because everybody wanted a piece of Isaac Bruce. Isaac Bruce and, and later on Torrey Holt. But, but in the greatest show on turf days, that was Isaac Bruce. Edger and James, um, one of only four running backs in NFL history to rush for 1,500 yards four times. The others, Eric Dickerson, Walter Payton, Barry Sanders. It's a good list. Pretty good company, right? He didn't have as consistent and, 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 and as, as consistently producing career as those guys did, but, but those four seasons in the middle, which I think it's fair to judge a running back based on his best four or five seasons in terms of Hall of Fame value. But for them, and then again, yeah, you, you have your automatics with Tony Gonzalez and Ed Reed. Nobody nobody hit you like Ed Reed hit you in the NFL. One of my favorite players of all time, Ed Reed. You guys, you two, any, anything anything that, that you want to defend over there or maybe give a reason you didn't put anybody in? Before we do that, I will give a reason I didn't put Champ Bailey in. Um, I think Champ Bailey is absolutely a Hall of Fame defensive back. I just don't think he's a first ballot Hall of Fame defensive back. To me, that is reserved for guys like Ed Reed who were unbelievably dominant at the position that they played. And I think that's the same reason I kind of skipped out on Steve Atwater because I know he's one of the other big hitting safeties that has been in the league. And um, I'm blanking on the name. I just had it in my head. Uh, John Lynch, yeah. him as well. Yeah. I think that they will both become Hall of Famers, just not first ballot like yeah. the other like the other guys that we mentioned. So those are, those are the finalists for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Um. I think we're going to have an exciting next couple of years in terms of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Next year, uh, we see Troy Palomalu on the list. Reggie Wayne will also be on that list next year. Uh, former Missouri Tiger Justin Smith uh, could potentially be a finalist. Patrick Willis, former uh, San Francisco 49ers linebacker, all potentially on that list for next year, uh, for 2020. And then 2021 uh, will, of course, feature Peyton Manning. So, you want a first ballot Hall of Famer, you got one right there in Peyton Manning. So, a, a good couple of years in terms of Hall of Fame eligibility, and we'll continue to just keep, you know, great names coming into the Hall of Fame, and I think we're, we're seeing at the very least two of them this year in, in Tony Gonzalez and Ed Reed. Didn't talk a ton about Tony Gonzalez. Uh, I think when he retired was the unanimous selection for the greatest tight end of all time. We would all agree with I, that. I agree with that. I think over the last couple of years, Antonio Gates has made his case for that. But I, I still think it's Tony Gonzalez. I don't I, I don't think Antonio Gates has done enough in the last few years to you know, jump Gonzalez. I think he's gotten a lot closer, but but not to jump him. So, yeah, at the very least when he retired, a unanimous choice for the greatest tight end ever ever to play in the NFL. So that will go for, uh, for our Hall of Fame picks. And I believe that's going to cut our NFL segment. 